Hey Farmers Branch family, glad to be back with you. I want to thank everyone uh, who has been praying for my father. He's doing quite well. Recovered from the heart attack nicely. And uh, got a stent placed in one of his coronaries and he's uh, doing really very well. Now it's time to pray for all of us who are in the house with him. He is feeling much better. Yeah, he, great guy. And, but he is, he does uh, say thank you for your prayers. Welcome to our whirlwind tour through the Gospel of John. We left off uh, last time I was with you a couple of weeks ago. Although a lot of things have changed in that period of time. Uh, I've lost a lot of hair since the barbershop opened back up, thankfully. Uh, I've not made good on my threat to grow a ponytail. Sonia's very disappointed, but... Oh, this mask thing. Um, I, I have, I, I like it. I hope, I hope it's a permanent uh, fixture in American society. I seem to be far more socially acceptable when wearing one. I don't, I can't account for that. It's just that people react to me much better when most of my face is covered up. But welcome to the study of John. We, last time <clears throat> I talked uh, in Bible study from the comfy chair, we were on the 16th chapter of John and we left off with the 33rd verse. I have told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And you recall that that word, you will have trouble, is glypsis in Greek. It's the same word that's translated as tribulation, as in great tribulation and uh, some translations, especially notably the King James Version says, in this world, you will have tribulation. But Descartes, he has overcome the world. And with that being said, in the 17th chapter, John records, after this, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Now, what follows here is uh, the prayer that the Lord prayed for himself, for his disciples that were with him and for all those that would come. It's very unlike the prayer we were told to pray. When asked how should we pray, pointing out that John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray, they asked the Savior and he said, pray like this, our Heavenly Father, we consider your name holy. And it proceeds from there, what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Now, here is the Lord's Prayer, only it's different in context. It is actually the Lord praying. We take it that he is praying aloud because much of this prayer seems to be a genuine, well, a genuine communication between Jesus and his Heavenly Father. Much of what is said is apparently for the benefit of those that are listening. And uh, uh, again, in order to get the meaning, I will again paraphrase using acceptable translations of some of these Greek words, but just not the ones uh, that are used uh, in most English versions. Most English versions uh, use the, the simplest and most customary translation of some of these words, and some of them are very difficult to translate um, word for word, one word in translation for one word in Greek. Uh, so I will take the liberty here to paraphrase a bit. Some, perhaps I'll do it parenthetically so that you know what the actual word here in the New International Version is while substituting another translation of that Greek word that is perfectly acceptable. 
like uh, many like English words that have more than one meaning depending on the context, uh, the, the Greek is no exception to that. So we're going to expound on it just a little bit as we go. It says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. Don't glorify the Son for his own sake, but for the Father's own glory. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Jesus here talking in the second person. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now, before we leave this portion of the prayer, uh, let's go back. The, Jesus has said, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And that work was handed to him, not when he occupied the manger at Bethlehem. Not, uh, it wasn't conferred upon him instantaneously at the occasion of his baptism. This job, this task, this plan was given to him before the foundation of the world. Now you remember in our study of Revelation that uh, the, the story of the revelation begins in the throne room of God before the creation of the world. And thereafter, the lamb is known as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We see the, the task, the mission, the, the purpose here that, that Jesus is fulfilling. Here he uses the term ergos in Greek, or the work you gave me. Later in the prayer, we'll see that he uses that uh, onomus, uh, or name, to indicate a, uh, a purpose or a theme, uh, a work to do, uh, it, with a word that can be, is tra often translated name, uh, authority. Uh, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the authority according to the purpose of the Father, according to the purpose of the Son. And we'll see it used that way in a little bit. Here it uses ergos uh, to describe a work or a labor that he's given. And ever since I've spent a lot of time in the study of Revelation, it may seem to other people that the, uh, that the whole... Bible is now suddenly all about Revelation. Well, that's not true. It's Revelation that's about the rest of the Bible. So uh, let's get, as a matter of fact, it's just us here. So why don't we go to the Revelation? Give me a chance to, to get to the apocalypse, the Revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ as given to John on Patmos. And if we go to the fifth chapter, we see the plan of God rendered figuratively as a scroll with seven seals. Seven seals are removed to begin to have access to what is written on the scroll. The uh, seven trumpets announce that the scroll is going to be open and with the seventh trumpet we see Christ revealed as God incarnate uh, in the flesh uh, as subsequent to the seventh trumpet. So it says here, then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. 
he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons of every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. That's the work that Jesus was given before the foundation of the world were to bring many sons and daughters after the pattern of the original. So this is the work that he's talking about. It's not simply the, the act, the singular act of submission, uh, as, as glorious and as precious as that uh, sacrifice is. It's the work of bringing to God what is his, the children that he ordained for himself, the children that we are predestined to be after the image of his son. So back to our, our prayer. I just wanted to remind everyone that the work of Christ began before his earthly walk. but is completed at Calvary. All he has left now to do is to come and harpazo to snatch back like a thief that, that has been stolen from him. So Jesus uh, prays, finishes the section of the prayer that's private between him and the Father and now Father glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began a glimpse into that glory we just read in the unveiling, in the apocalypse, in the revelation. And Jesus now prays for his disciples. He says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. Now he uses here is I have revealed you. He uses that word that's translated name so often, onomos. And so in the context here, it, what it said, what he's saying is, I have revealed your plan. I have revealed your intentions under your authority to those whom you gave me out of the world. It's not I have revealed you some proper noun. Uh, I have revealed, to, like it's popular in some circles, I have revealed to you how you really pronounce my name. It has really nothing to do with how you pronounce his name, how you spell it whether it's Yahashua, Yahshua, Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, uh, Jesus. That's not what he's talking about. It is, I have revealed not a sacred proper noun or the proper pronunciation thereof, but I have revealed your intentions to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them, for they knew with certainty that I came from you, 
and they believed that you sent me. That's how they were recognized. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. Now let's stop there for a second and reflect on what has just been said. All I have is yours, all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through those you gave me who were yours. The, that stated elsewhere that we be, become the righteousness of God in Christ. The church, we, represent the righteousness of God in Christ. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, speaking to the Father. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Now, Again, this is that same word, animus. And so we can, we can legitimately render this. Holy Father, keep them faithful to your intent. Keep them faithful to your plan. Protect them by the power of your name. Keep them faithful to your mission, your intention, your plan. Keep them faithful to that. The plan you gave me, the mission, the intent that you gave me to fulfill so that they may be one as we are one. What's being said here is not one as a physical singularity, obviously. There are people that make that mistake. Uh, we all know them. Uh, we all love them. They are dear brothers and sisters in Christ, but they misunderstand what it means to be one, or they misunderstand fundamentally what it means for the Father and the Son to be one. So how can they really understand unity between brethren? What is being said here is there, the Father has an intent. He has a plan. He has a will that the Son is singular in fulfillment of what it is the Father wishes to be done. And that we can likewise be unified in our intent to fulfill that intent, that divine intent that in divine mission, and we can do it in lockstep. We may not appreciate the same aesthetics. The same, we all like different colors. We like different things. It's, it's not that kind of unity. It's unity being in lockstep together as members of the same body to fulfill the same plan that God has for the world and for us. You know, there, there is a body of scripture that I refer to a lot. We call it generally the Apocrypha. There's one writing, apocryphal writing, that I think is very useful. Um, whether you consider it to be scripture or not, it is very useful. And Second Esdras, are, um, it's the writings of Ezra, as given to, prophetically is given to him through dreams and visions by way of an angel messenger. 
but uh, you would find it as E-S-D-R-A-S, book number two. In that, there's an interesting passage where Ezra is concerned that no one will be found righteous uh, before God because, we, because the human beings always fall short of the law of God. And God chides him. He says, don't consider yourself among that number. Even though you and I both know you're right, there's a distinction between the righteous and the sinner and the wicked. We, the uh, angel goes on to explain to Ezra that, you know, this, it's not about judging the wicked. That's not what this world is about. In fact, God doesn't even give a thought to the wicked, but he cherishes the righteous. You know, we, we think a lot of times that, uh, that God is all concerned about the wicked and that, that our prophetic future is all about judging this world and judging the wickedness in this world. The angel tells, tells Ezra that God says, that just, that's just doesn't figure in this. He says, I just don't give the wicked a second thought because I take so much delight in the righteous. It's all about creating in the righteous that thing that he wants us to be. It's not about judging the wicked. Sin doesn't exist in this world to define wickedness. It exists in this world to create for God those sons and daughters with which he will delight in eternity. It's all about us becoming something very valuable to our creator. The trials, the tribulations, the pain, the betrayal, it, it's, it's not to punish us. It's to create in something very precious to God that cannot be created any other way. Don't make the mistake of thinking that it's all about perfect health, wealth, earthly prosperity. Uh, it's not about those things. It's about us becoming sons and daughters of God. It's about us assuming our rightful place in his kingdom it's not being too terribly attached to this world, but recognize that we are being prepared for a glory that we cannot imagine. Ears not heard, eyes not seen, neither has it entered into the heart of man. Those things that await us as faithful children of God. On with the prayer. It says, I will re remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them. Keep them faithful to your plan, the plan you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name, by that anonymous, by that plan you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they're not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Sanctify them by the truth. Or sanctify them, give them to a holy purpose. 
for them to live in accordance with the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Sanctified is, of course, not an earthly state of sinless perfection. No, lots of people have misunderstood that. Sancti to be sanctified is to be completely set apart for the holy purpose that God intends for us. It's to be completely set apart and dedicated to that plan that the Father gave the Son and the Son has given us. It's, it's again, it is not a state of sinless perfection on this, in this life. Verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. Now here's, here's the part where he prays for us. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Now, Jesus is praying for David Finch. David Finch needs to listen. And David Finch needs to take to heart that Jesus' prayers get answered. We'll get to a little more of that later. But I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and I have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them I have revealed your personality. I have revealed your character to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. We don't have recorded by John the reaction that the disciples had to this prayer. And because they couldn't have at that point understood the impact that the message they possessed would have on the world. Over 2,000 years later to David Finch reading these words, sitting in a comfortable chair. But I can only imagine that it may have had much of the same effect that it has on me today. But I have the advantage of knowing that these words are durable and that this prayer is not time limited. But it applies to us. It is powerful and it is the prayer that covers us. So if we find that there are divisions among us and strife, 
those are among some of the more wicked works of the flesh. We need to stop and think. Is this what we have been set aside for? Is this the purpose for which we are sanctified? To have divisions and strife among us. That's not in keeping with the prayer that Jesus prayed for us. And so if we look to the source of our sanctification and what that purpose is to which we are sanctified, perhaps we would behave a little differently. So it says, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. Now there's more than one modern uh, valley in the land of Israel that's referred to as Kidron. Uh, this one is referring to the a hollow place that separated the um, eastern wall of Jerusalem from the area that contained an olive grove and a garden called Gethsemane. So it says, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And he asked them again, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. And this happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. He just said those words prior to going to the garden, correct? Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. And if you recall, it's also my opinion that it was Caiaphas that was the subject of the polemic of the biting uh, critical words that Jesus put into a story about Lazarus, one a beggar named Lazarus at the gate of the rich man. And it just happened to be the only rich man in Israel dressed in purple and fine linen who happened to have been Caiaphas. There's no love lost. Uh, Caiaphas and his father-in-law, Annas, and his four brother-in-laws. They, they knew who Jesus was. And they remembered what Jesus had said about them. So this is, we enter here the story of his uh, betrayal, of his uh, trial, and then his crucifixion. It's a, it's a poignant story, uh, and I think it's best done uh, a bit separate from the words of the prayer that we just studied. Go back and read that prayer. Go back and read it and say, you know, He's talking about me. 
how should I live given that the Savior prayed that kind of prayer for me? And it's not about just me singularly. It's about me being one with all the other sons and daughters. We need to take a look at ourselves and see, are we in lockstep, arm in arm, to fulfill the task, the plan that the Father gave the Savior and the Savior gave to us? Are our efforts in keeping with accomplishing what it is we've been given to do? Are we more worried about our own status, our own positions, our own prosperity to keep in mind that we collectively are the temple of God? I hope not. And so until next time, so long.